Tibetans are marking 60 years of their uprising against Chinese rule. But are they any closer to a homeland of their own? Beijing insists Tibet is part of its territory. But what's it doing to win the hearts and minds of Tibetans? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bays. Tibet is a mainly Buddhist Himalayan area of plateaus and mountains known as the roof of the world. It's been governed by China as an autonomous region for almost seven decades and Beijing claims a centuries-old sovereignty over the region. But the allegiances of many Tibetans lie with their exiled spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama. For China, he's a separatist threat, a living god for his followers. Huge crowds gathered at his temple in India on Sunday to commemorate 60 years since the failed Tibetan uprising against Chinese rule. Supporters of the 83-year-old peace icon prayed at the Buddhist shrine in mountainous Dharamsala, where the Dalai Lama established a government in exile. Hundreds of Tibetans and Taiwanese rallied in Taipei, the capital of the self-governing island that China also claims as its territory. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first let's hear what some of those protesters had to say. This is a proud day that till now we were 60 years we are in exile, still our struggle is young and fresh and strong. So we can give a message to China that until the Tibetans remain, our struggle will never get end. We have members of parliament coming from about 10 countries. And uh, this will show, uh, send a signal to China that you know, the issue of Tibet is not dead. It's very much alive and the international community supports the issue of Tibet. Tibet declared its independence from China in the early 20th century. But Beijing took back control in 1950 by sending thousands of troops. A year later, Tibetan leaders signed a treaty that confirmed China's sovereignty over the region and guaranteed Tibetan autonomy. But the Tibetans say they were forced to accept that agreement. In 1959, mounting resentment against Chinese rule led to a failed uprising, and the Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama, was then forced to flee to northern India. Six years later, the Chinese government established the Tibet Autonomous Region, which included about half of traditional Tibet. In 1999, China said the door was open for the Dalai Lama, provided he abandoned his calls for independence, but talks between the two sides have stalled since 2010. Well, let's bring in our panel of experts to discuss all of this. And in Beijing, we have Aina Tangen. He's a political analyst who advises the Chinese government on economic and development issues. In Brussels, Andrew Fisher. He's a professor at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, who researches the impact of Chinese development policies in Tibet. And in New Delhi, we have Tibetan activist, writer and poet Tenzin Sundo. Welcome to you all. Let me take you right back at the beginning of our discussion to 60 years ago, in fact, even further. Andrew, perhaps we could start with you. Give us the historical context of what happened. Let's maybe start for now in 1950. Uh, well, if we start in 19... I, I would actually prefer to start even earlier than that. If we look at the breakdown of the Qing Empire, <clears throat> what we're essentially looking at is an empire that was uh, not even Han Chinese, it was Manchurian. And it was based on a notion of uh, various um, nationalities uh, joining together, but as we see the emergence, both with the nationalists and the communists, of an, a modern na uh, notion of nationhood, uh, it was very much based on a notion of Han Chinese nationalism, uh, which had difficulty incorporating uh, the minority regions of China, Xinjiang, Mongolia, and um, the Tibetan areas. And so this, I think this has been a tension underlying the Chinese position uh, ever since uh, in the modern period in the 20th century. Uh, so in 1950, essentially, you had a situation where uh, the communists won uh, the civil war and they were reasserting their control over the boundaries. And uh, the choice facing Han Chinese nationalism at that point was, do we, do we actually impose our sovereignty on the Han Chinese national, uh, national spaces and allow autonomy to the... To, to the um, 
to the other nationalities that were previously incorporated into it, into the Manchu Empire, or do we actually incorporate them into a Chinese nation state, but that's dominated by one nationality, and, and, uh, and they chose the latter course of action. So I think a lot of the tensions, both in Tibet, Xinjiang, and in Mongolia, stem from that, that tension, basically, in the 20th century. Clearly, the problem um, here is whether the, how you see the history of Tibet, and certainly I think there might be different views in Beijing and among the Tibetan uh, community outside Tibet uh, and where you are, Sundu, in Delhi. Tell me, what's your view, Sundu? Was this an independent state once that's now under occupation, or was it always Chinese? Well, just, <clears throat> just as Andrew Fisher made it very clear, that right from the beginning in 1911, when there was a Chinese revolution, it was uh, the new China emerging, coming out of uh, the former uh, Manchu rule. It was Manchuria, which was a separate militarily uh, uh, powerful country ruling over China. So till 1911, China was itself under foreign occupation. So the new China really emerged in 1911. Even at that time, China was attempting to uh, act like the Manchus, trying to control over other occupied countries or, uh, or countries where Manchus had the influence, like Mongolia or Tibet. So when Chinese attempt in 1911-1912 uh, to control over Tibet failed because Tibetan military beat the Chinese back into their country. So then we come back to 1949 when Mao Zedong consolidated its political power with the formation of People's Republic of China. So when communism came into power, then once again they reasserted uh, their uh, right to control over former uh, colonies or places of influence like Tibet. So okay. China so, once Sundu, again Sundu, attempted Sundu, can to I just control interrupt over you there? Mongolia, you, you've mentioned East, Sundu, East Sundu, just one second. You've mentioned two key dates yeah. there, 1912 and 1949. Yes. In the intervening period, was Tibet an independent, self-governing country? Let's be clear what your view is on that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Between 1913 till 1949, Tibet was a free and independent country. Not only that, Tibet signed the Magmohan Treaty with the British Empire. That's how Arunachal Pradesh of India became a part of um, British Empire. Today is a part of India. So India must recognize that Arunachal Pradesh became a part of India because British Empire signed that document with independent Tibet. So therefore, Tibet really flourished as an independent country without any foreign uh, control or rule or even, even influence. In fact, in 1947, when India regained its independence during the uh, uh, first a Asian Relations Conference in the presence of Gandhiji, Tibet represented as an independent country in the Asian Relations Conference. Tibet had always been like that. In 1949, China attempted to invade Tibet. Not only this, East Turkestan, Mongolia or, were also occupied by China in 1949 and 1950. Okay, let fighting. me bring in Aina. So which let me bring in, in Aina, because the reason I'm going into all of this history, which may seem a long time ago to our viewers, is that account, I think, Aina, is disputed in Beijing, isn't it? Uh, in Beijing, they believe that Tibet has always been Chinese. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, if you go through history, nothing has been forever one place. But if, you, if you're just going back to uh, uh, the early uh, 20th century and you start looking, what happened is, the, uh, from the Chinese perspective, the Qing Empire is uh, deteriorating. It's very weak. Uh, during that period, uh, Tibet basically went off as on its own. It was never recognized by either the Qing Empire or any, anybody else that it was independent in terms of China. Uh, then later on, uh, you have the founding of the New Republic. They reassert control over areas that they believe are traditionally under their sway. Uh, if you look over uh, the many hundreds of years, uh, Tibet was, in fact, a vassal state, but that was very different. Now, keep in mind, uh, at the time that we're talking about in 1959, Tibet is a, uh, a, f a feudal theocracy. Ninety-five percent of the people are 
uh, either slaves or serfs or indentured to the land. Uh, there's a 90% illiteracy. Um, life expectancy is very, very short, about 35.5 years. Uh, about one third of the women die in childbirth. Um, it's not exactly a panacea. Uh, this is uh, not, not uh, lost horizons that we're talking about. So from the Chinese perspective, when they come, uh, come into Tibet, uh, they're kind of horrified. I mean, the conditions there, are, it's, it's difficult in China, but it's even more, they see it even uh, more harsh in this very, uh, uh, you know, distant land. Okay. So they, well, they I, 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 can, I can see uh, Sundu to, is in, not, I can see, uh, for one Nirvana. moment, Aina, I see Sundu is not really agreeing with that picture of uh, his uh, homeland, Tibet. Sundu, what was your dispute with that account? Yeah. See, see, if he's saying that Tibet was in such a situation, you must know under Mao's rule, 45 million Chinese died of starvation. So what condition are you then promising? Are you claiming? And if you think you have liberated Tibet, then you should go back to their own country. You should go back to your own country if you have so much liberated, so much deliver, delivered that kind of a development. Your China's uh, attitude today has that it has not only toppled the Manchu Empire, today China is owning, adapt, adapting entire history of Manchuria as their own. Now, you, now China is going back even further in history. China is saying entire history of Yuan dynasty, which is actually Mongolians ruling over China. Today, China is saying even that is history of China. So how much China wants to colonize history? How much China wants to colonize uh, people, cultures, languages? No. When 1911, when China was toppling the Manchurians, Chinese people said, we are now free of foreign occupation. And therefore, the, the long-plated uh, hair brand, how the men in China were wearing, they said, we have to cut this because this is a, a culture of the Manchus. We are now free and independent China. China has forgotten this. China is now adapting history, oh, colonizing history. That's so very false. You cannot keep lying this in the world today. I need to get out of history in a moment, but I still think we're looking particularly today at the events of 1959. Andrew, 1959, the Dalai Lama was the man who moved, who fled to India. Explain to our viewers the importance of the Dalai Lama as a political leader, a spiritual leader, actually as a god to people in Tibet? Uh, well, he wasn't a god because uh, he, he uh, Buddhists are atheists. And I just, if I can just correct, make a correction there, I just want to uh, make a comment about the, the, a few of the points made by our, our esteemed colleague in Beijing, which was that I think he basically repeated a bunch of uh, government propaganda there. Because, for instance, just the terminology, theocracy, implies belief in God, where there is no Buddhist do not believe in God. Uh, they're atheist. And the idea that, if, that uh, Tibet was feudal is a standard part of the Marxist interpretation of Tibetan history that has very little basis in actual historical study. It's more of a characterization of, and a way to delegitimize um, uh, to pre, you know, pre-modern Tibet, essentially. Uh, we can talk about high mortality statistics for women and children, but that existed all over Asia at the time. So there's no surprise that it would be the same in Tibet as it would be in China and India. It's not to discredit the fact that Tibetans as Bhutanese would have achieved similar types of human development outcomes as the Chinese uh, did over the last 50, 60 years. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, the Dalai Lama is, is, is basically seen by Tibetans as the reincarnation. They have a system of reincarnation, of recognized reincarnations of previous realized uh, enlightened beings. And he's seen as basically a, a, a reincarnation of the Buddha of compassion in that sense. So he's, 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 he's um, uh, one of the top uh, lamas in the, in the religious hierarchy, um, and uh, particularly of the Gelukpa tradition of uh, Buddhism. Uh, which is one of the four main Tibetan traditions. There are several other minor traditions. But he was also seen as the head of state of, of, of the Podrang government, which was the government in Lhasa at the time that controlled what is today essentially the Tibet Autonomous Region. So the boundaries of the Tibet Autonomous Region, uh, which accounts for about half of the Tibetan territory in China, uh, recognized by the Chinese government as Tibetan autonomous areas, 
the Tibetan Autonomous Region is, was basically the territory controlled by the government led by the young Dalai Lama at the time of the Chinese invasion, or what the Chinese prefer to call the peaceful liberation in 1950. And Sundu, it was on the basis of that territory. Sundu, that, can, I, can I bring that, you uh, in? That, that um, they, on on the, the Dalai Lama then, in 1959 yeah. and the Dalai Lama now because he's led your people's struggle <clears throat> and he has not managed to return to Tibet so he has been over 60 years pretty unsuccessful would you agree with that yes his holiness the Dalai Lama yeah his holiness the Dalai Lama is our spiritual and political leader he is as we Tibetans say uh, so he's, for us, the Dalai Lama is the eyes of the people and the hearts of the people. He is, but he has always not been like this. Uh, ever since we have come into exile, he had meant much more to us. So he's, he's the one who had led us through this, uh, through this difficult period, a struggle with great sense of calm, confidence and happiness. So he's the one who we look up to as our hope. So therefore, whatever His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been able to achieve today, although it's not with the fruition of independence of Tibet, but he has led us through a difficult time. Out of that, today, Tibetans, both inside Tibet and outside, we are much more confident, we are united, we have a great sense of hope. And this is what His Holiness has done. And today, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is not just a Tibetan people's leader. He is the icon of peace around the world. And, and therefore, I think that one smile of the Dalai Lama is much more powerful and potent than all the China's money and military power put together. Aina, this is a man who won the Nobel Peace Prize. He is a person who, whose representatives the Chinese government did for a time, for quite a long time, negotiate with. In Beijing, is the Dalai Lama still seen as relevant? Uh, increasingly not so. I mean, there's no doubt that he is an extremely charismatic ma uh, man and that he has uh, held together the Tibetan cause uh, in exile for uh, all these 60 years. The, the issue is, what is it that, uh, the, that he and the Tibetan Youth Congress actually want? Uh, they want to, f quote, free Tibet. Uh, I don't know that that is possible. Um, and it's just one of those things. I understand there's an emotional uh, element to this expressed by uh, my colleague. And I understand that uh, my intellectual colleague wants to split hairs uh, on, in terms of you know, defining this. And arguments can be made both ways. But in the end, what we're talking about here is a actually pretty, from an economic point of view, very, very good. I mean, in 1960, they had a, roughly 115 million renminbi uh, GDP of Tibet. And uh, today, it's l literally 900 times that amount. Uh, long uh, longevity is going to be probably around 70 years of age uh, by 2020. They have, uh, literacy has gone way, way up. Uh, there are now roads, uh, airports, and things linking Tibet, which was very remote, uh, to the rest of the world. And but come on, Aina. Come on, Aina. That economic progress. Uh, this, We're talking uh, about 60 years. There's been mm -hmm. economic progress in all parts of the world over uh, the last uh, 60 years, has there not? I mean, mm -hmm. that seems a little bit unfair to, 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 to talk about modernization, yes, which happens and, and, everywhere. And, and the issue... No. Let's, that's one very, second, one second. It's very fine for you to say that, but you have a group of people who are basically coming back and saying that they, they long for the good old days, that they want to resurrect this uh, previous things. And I do think, because it is a spiritual at leader all. who's also Our a government China leader, that she not true who qualifies all. as a feudal a theocracy. Mm. And okay, that's stop, you the there, it works. stop you there, I Stop you there. I want to bring hairs on it. I want to bring Sundu. I want to bring Sundu. I want to bring Sundu back there because he is w wagging yeah. his finger at you, Sundu. Make make your point, and also <laughs> tell me what happens See. next because the Dalai Lama yeah. is 83 years old. What he's not going to last forever. Okay, firstly. Uh, our man in China who is now talking about statistics and longevity, uh, I have to tell you, China today treats its people like animals. You want to give them food, but no freedom. 
you want to keep and control over them never give freedom look at this 1.3 million chinese cannot continue to live under that of a dictatorial control you cannot treat people like animals more than eating food or uh, setting up schools or dictator people need freedom freedom of the mind that is more important and if you are asking me a question about future of tibet there was a point of time when china invaded tibet east turkestan mongolia manchuria 60% of china's occupied land today is is stolen from these occupied countries china must give freedom to their own people and the occupied people today problem of tibet is globalized one internationally 150 countries trade with china they benefit from china's dictatorial authoritarian rule over chinese people and the occupied countries 150 countries are benefiting from china's uh, colonial rule in tibet which leads to uh, environmental de degradation uh, human rights violations uh, and also a uh, damming and mining and 155 tibetans burned themselves uh, alive for the freedom of tibet so okay. all this is caused okay. really let me, because let me bring, tibet let me today bring has in andrew and ask about problem, what happens after this dalai lama because you could make an argument that china would be sensible to negotiate with this somewhat moderate figure and what comes afterwards could be more difficult for china andrew Well, first, I'd like to clarify that that uh, there was a false statement that the Dalai Lama is calling for free Tibet. Uh, he hasn't been since at least 1988. I think it was in 1988, perhaps before, in the Strasbourg proposals when he abandoned the claim, the claim for independence. And from since then, his consistent approach, the middle way approach, has been to ask for just uh, he accepting Chinese sovereignty over Tibet and just accept, uh, asking for more autonomy, essentially uh, applying. the autonomy that's promised under the chinese constitution applying it in terms of protection of language protection of culture and also giving more sort of local control over over the system perhaps also asking for things like democracy which are probably unreasonable expectations in the current context uh so it's not the case that he's been calling for freedom uh and i i think yes it's true that a lot of these social achievements and economic achievements have been made in tibet but i think it's quite comparable to what's been made in bhutan for instance bhutan is an independent nation uh, also heavily subsidized by india and increasingly china but nonetheless under a situation of political independence so it's not to say that china's occupation and control of tibet in the way it occurs today is necessary for those social and economic achievements to have been made Uh, I think the situation is, especially in central Tibet, essentially I've often called it like a police state. It's an extremely repressive political environment with a huge amount of control, uh, not quite to the extent of what we're seeing currently in um, Xinjiang uh, with the uh, the labor camps and so on. But there's some fear that that those models will be transposed over to Tibet, uh, and uh, the, the, I think the worry right now is not, of course. the Dalai Lama remains extremely inspirational and relevant person internationally but uh in the context of uh of a negotiator with the Chinese I I would agree with uh, um um my colleague from Beijing that is probably less and less uh relevant for the Chinese in the sense that they seem to be pushing ahead with a very strong armed uh, assimilationist approach in Tibet hoping that just over time that will win over at least establish and solidify their control over the region and that's I think the situation we're looking at right now it's it's uh, many aspects of the situation are worrisome but it is true that it's a booming economy but as i've studied in a lot of my work it's booming simply because beijing is pouring so much subsidies into the region uh building infrastructure building uh rail uh, rail links and so on um large scale hydroelectric projects much of which is most of which is actually going to chinese companies and so on of course there is significant about trickle down uh people have more and more wealth and spending and so on but that's essentially not the grievance of tibetans today i mean the the government likes to frame the grievances of tibetan as if it's just about poverty uh whereas the grievances of tibetan are 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 really about uh, discrimination and disempowerment and a lack of control thank you andrew thank you to all our guests aina tangan andrew fisher and tenjin sunday i'm sure thanks to them you like me now know more about tibet than you did 30 minutes ago If you want to catch the show again, go to aljazeera.com and if you have a point that you want to make on Tibet or anything else for that matter, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com/ajinsidestory and on Twitter 
We're at AEJ Inside Story. I'll be back 24 hours from now. Until then, bye-bye.